this is Allison Tigard, and we're one of um, nine members of the Arts Council of Clutsop County. And today, um, we are here to report on the um, Arts and Economic Prosperity 5 study that we completed this last year and um, have the results to share um, with this commission, which did commission this study. So, um, and of course, the uh, members of the community, thank you. <clears throat> the arts mean business in Clatsop County. It's pretty straightforward. What we are doing today is um, discussing the relationship between um, the arts in this area and uh, the economic impact. Um, we're going to talk about a couple things. Um, this is actually a fairly brief presentation. Um, first, what is the Arts Council of Clatsop County? What is the Arts and Economic Prosperity 5 study? What are the specific results for our county? And what is the overall impact of arts in our region? So you may have, uh, you may know a little bit about us, but the Arts Council of Clatsop County, uh, we do hold monthly meetings. Those meetings are open to the public and they are held throughout the county. So despite um, many times we do meet in Astoria, um, we, we do represent the county and we have representatives that do represent um, uh, from really Arch Cape all the way up through Napa. You'll see there the council member names. And uh, we certainly have our county liaison, uh, Sarah Nebaker, and we're very grateful to the support that we've gotten from the county to do our work with the council. Um, I would also like to just acknowledge Teresa Durs, who is here, who is uh, really uh, instrumental in our work, and also acknowledge uh, Robin Risley, who is here today. Robin, raise your hand, please. Who is also on the council? Thank you. <laughs> um, the mission of the Arts Council, uh, which was established in 2014, is to support, promote, advocate, and encourage the arts. We also focus on um, education in arts and um, the use of public spaces for uh, public art. Um, could I just ask our commissioners, do you, um, were you, do, are you all familiar with our, with our, our committee and our oh, yeah, council? I am. Awesome, <clears throat> awesome. So this is really like our first big project and we're really proud of it. You may have read some really great articles that have already been written through the Daily Astorian and such just about this study, but we're hoping here today that we can explain a little bit more and give you a chance to ask any follow-up questions or give us some direction on how we can use this information to continue the really wonderful partnerships that we already have here going on in the county. What we did here with the prosperity study, we did not act alone. So what happened was is we used um, part of our budget. We paid to participate um, with support from the state, specifically through the Oregon Arts Commission. We have a partnership with um, specifically Brian Wagner down there in Salem, who really helped us to guide us to find our way through this pretty comprehensive quantitative and qualitative study. Um, all of this is being done through Americans for the Arts out of Washington, D.C. So we did have a representative uh, all the way in Washington, D.C. that we had to report to and get some guidance from. So this is a really wonderful thing that we've been a part of, really from the national and the state and the local level. Uh, this is the first time that Clatsop County has participated in this. It's been done before uh, on the Central Coast but never has Clatsop County had its own figures. That's why it's so significant to us today. Um, essentially what happened was our uh, commission members and other volunteers um, attended arts events throughout the county in 2016. And essentially, uh, as in the photo you can see, had these clipboards and one page surveys. And we went up and pestered um, most of the guests and had them fill them out. You were relentless. Your volunteer. You. They made we sure those were filled out. They did. Um, and they asked a variety of questions, including um, things like what uh, what kind of money did they spend uh, before the event? Did they plan on spending after the event? How much was their lodging, if they had any? Um, child care. Um, asked things like what zip code they came from, and just some basic demographics, those kinds of things. The other half of the, this uh, prosperity study included the nonprofits, arts organizations filling out information regarding their budgets, their employees, and um, their staffing and events, that kind of stuff. And essentially, 
Um, we turned all of that into the Americans for the Arts, and they put together um, our data with the results. And it's really interesting to note on the audience surveys that when we approached people, we didn't know whether, obviously, whether they lived here or not. And many people said, oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't live here. I don't want to fill out a, you know, a <coughs> survey. And we explained that we'd like them to anyway. But what's really interesting is that if you were to access the full study, which is available on the website, you'd see that we have about half and half which means that half of the people that filled those surveys out live here and half don't. So it's a really significant thing to see the turnout year round from January to December of people not only visiting this place, but also locals like us that live here, that choose to live here for a lot of reasons, but one of them being we have such a rich arts and culture scene. You'll see here we had a, a span of, of throughout the whole calendar year, we had quarterly reports. So it's not like we could collect all of our data just in the summertime when this place is booming and there's lots of cars lined up on the 30, right? We had to collect surveys throughout the whole year. So that means even on a night just like tonight in the dark, in the rain, people are still showing up to the Liberty Theater. They're still going to the Fisher Poet Society. They are still waiting in line to see theater, music, poetry. Uh, these surveys were completed per party, not per person, which means that if uh, Don and his wife and my husband and I all went out, we would get one survey because perhaps maybe uh, someone took, maybe someone paid for dinner for the whole for the whole crew, and somebody else took care of drinks. So we would be considered one survey. So it was a, a quite a lot of work, and only 50 surveys could be collected per event. So we couldn't just get, let's say. Uh, 500 surveys from the music festival that wouldn't count we did have over 800 surveys collected and 22 nonprofits completed those surveys um, the, this is actually 21 of the 22 nonprofits the Arts Council itself is included in that um, and we have yet to develop a logo we're working on that <laughs> um, but these are the organizations um, that did respond and we do appreciate their participation. And it's important to note that these organizations were not identified by us, by our council. These were actually uh, already selected by um, Americans for the Arts. Uh, they had pre-selected any organization that has any kind of arts or cultural programming needed to be included. So you'll see there, for example, um, uh, the Classic County Historical Society which you might not associate with the arts, but they certainly have cultural programming. So these were pre-identified for us to go ahead and contact, to ask them to provide us with some data regarding their expenditures, their staffing. How many people do they employ? What kind of money do they spend? What do they have as far as figures of their attendance? Those sorts of figures. So what did we learn? The big number, uh, $13.7 million in Clatsop County, which is uh, a pretty awesome figure. We are told, by the way, we're not supposed to compare ourselves to other places, but uh, this is a pretty big deal. We're, we're quite proud of $13.7 million. We have 359 full-time equivalent jobs. So that includes, let's say, that you've got a couple of uh, uh, part-time uh, jobs. All of those were compiled into, they really wanted to measure uh, full-time FTE. So that's why you'll see that figure represented that way. Um, but this includes anyone uh, that might be employed. Let's say even um, if the Liberty Theater hires electricians to, to work there. All of those figures are compiled to hopefully um, capture that, that larger picture of people that are connected with employment by the arts and culture sector, generating $1.3 million in local and state government revenue. Um, a big part about being involved in the arts um, out here in the county is obviously volunteerism, um, which really drives the arts around here. And we learned that over 1,200 people donated 80,000 plus hours um, to arts programming and events, which does bring in uh, money and economy to the county. Um, if you tabulate that at 15 to $25 an hour, that's a volunteer uh, effort of one to two million dollars. Very big deal. So you'll see here some figures. Again, like I said, it's almost right down the line between <clears throat> residents and non-residents of the attendance that we were able to capture. Uh, we did go to events 
events, uh, any kind of event that was related to arts and culture counted. So when we surveyed audience members, we were all the way down to every art walk from the seaside art walks to the Astoria art, work, uh, art walks. We went to uh, regular festivals um, like the Stormy, Stormy Arts Festival, um, Stormy Weather Arts Festival, as well as uh, the Astoria Music Festival. But we also, uh, I was on Christmas Eve down there at the children's performance at the Coaster Theater. So uh, kind of one-off events, just talking to locals, why are you here, and uh, how are you spending your time here today? Um, so this is what we think is the most significant part of this uh, survey, that arts drive tourism. 66% of non-residents stated that their primary purpose to Clatsop County was to specifically attend this arts and cultural event. What that means is if there was not an arts or cultural event here, they would not <clears throat> have visited. Conversely. So uh, just again, just about half of local residents said that they would have traveled somewhere else if this arts and cultural event wasn't happening. So even the retention of local dollars is really impacted by things that are happening here in Clatsop County. Um, we learned that cultural tourists spend more uh, $115 approximately to $27 for locals and that can be chalked up to primarily obviously lodging and uh, dinner versus um, eating at home and going to home and that kind of stuff. But they, people do spend money when they go out. They do and you just have to pause here with these figures because it's important to note that these figures do not reflect the ticket cost of that event. So that means in addition to the ticket price these were the dollars that were spent, um, $115 for non-residents, $27 for locals. Um, and just like Don said, primarily the difference is really lodging. But people are spending money in our restaurants. They are buying gifts. They are spending those dollars here. So this is a combination of, of hotel rooms, restaurants, and like you said, gifts. Not just the, not the ticket prices of what they're doing. That's right. And the reason why they didn't include the ticket price there was because those ticket prices were already counted for in the nonprofit uh, organization numbers. And they didn't want to duplicate those numbers. So when the nonprofits, that, those 22 nonprofits that provided data, when they talk about their expenditures and their revenue, we didn't want to count that, those numbers twice. So their revenue counts those ticket sales. So that's why when we talk about dollars spent, we didn't want to, they didn't want to muddy the waters with those figures represented twice. And that's the folks um, that are participating, this, the cultural tourists. But when you said that the electrician at the Liberty Theater might be counted as jobs, yeah. were um, hotel jobs or restaurant jobs counted? Or is, that a separate, is that included in that? That is included. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what does this all mean? Uh, for a little perspective, Allison. <laughs> so um, these are some figures specifically to our county. We did talk with Kevin Leahy uh, over at Cedar just to find out a little bit more uh, for some context how these numbers look in our county. Uh, we know that the forest and wood products is about 30% of our economic base, fishing and seafood processing about 20%. Nonprofit arts, we're looking at 5%. Again, this is just nonprofit, not including for profit arts and cultural events. <coughs> What's really interesting, though, is we do have three of the fastest growing breweries in Oregon. We know that Fort George, Bowie, and Pelican. And when you look at the dollars that are being spent, specifically, if we look at half of the residents, that, that spent their money here uh, on an arts and cultural event wouldn't have spent them if they had, you know, if it weren't happening. And the people that came here, that visited here, half of them would have left if that event weren't happening, right? And then you look at their spending their dollars in our restaurants, and now we see that those restaurants and those, those, those places are, are growing. We can see the correlation, right? We can start to see that there is a connection specifically between those uh, growing industries and the people that are coming here and why they choose to visit us specifically. So they don't, I don't, I, I've seen figures, but I, it's not in my head right now. Is, yeah. Um, forest and wood products, fishing, seafood, what would the percentage be for hospitality, tourism, brewing? Just, do we have that figure by any chance? We do not have that figure. This was, again, provided by uh, Cedar. Um, but the hospitality, tourism, brewing, distilling, retail does tie in to what the 
Because that's uh, certainly significant in this town. So. For sure. Huge. And so that's basically what they're saying that the cultural tourists are spending their money on, are those types of activities. Um, this is a quote from Kevin Leahy, and you guys can read it, but I'm just going to read the red part. Um, 13.8 million for nonprofits, which does not count the any for-profit business, nor so does it take into effect the multiplier effect, which can add seven times that dollar amount in, in direct spending and expenditures. What that means is every dollar that is spent here changes hands seven times before it leaves the county. And that's why it's so important to have events that, lead, that keep locals here and their dollars and brings tourists, cultural tourists, to town so that that dollar can be passed around seven times before it leaves town. And if you do that math, you get almost nearly $100 million of economic impact from the nonprofits alone. What's next? So um, it's important for the Board of Commissioners to know just the work that we've done with this already. Um, this study is not new. You've probably seen um, quite a bit of literature about it already. But it's important for you to know that we have been traveling around the, uh, the county to give this information to uh, chambers of commerce, um, other city councils. We really want um, partnerships to continue to build and how this is just our first step, right? So we want to do this study again in the future. And uh, we hope that this is going to give us a baseline so that we know how to use this and then compare it to future figures. Already I've been, uh, I've presented this to uh, the uh, ADHDA here in Astoria, talked uh, already with um, some of those small businesses about uh, continued partnerships and how we can and continue those relationships between small local businesses and arts events to sync those moments up. Um, we know that already this study is overlapping with some other quantitative data that's happened, like the cluster analysis with Main Street, Oregon happening with downtown Astoria. We know that, uh, for example, uh, uh, the Liberty Theater is finally getting some really interesting <laughs> figures that they're able to overlap with our figures where we can really start to track more of these patterns. So I think that those relationships that we're starting to build uh, for the first time to get this conversation going, not just here in Astoria, but throughout the county, is really, really exciting to us. This study happens every three years. We're hoping to participate again in three years. Uh, it takes a whole year to kind of get yourself going, a year of gathering, and then a year of presenting. So thank you for your time tonight and allowing us to give our first presentation of our first time participating in this really exciting study. Oh, thank you very much. That's a wonderful presentation. Does any of the board members have any questions or comments? Well done. Um, I, I, would, I have a couple of comments. Um, so the piece about volunteerism, all those people have to interact with other people. And this helps build our community. And that's a really important component that sometimes is overlooked. That many hours, that many people interacting for uh, something that benefits them and their community is a very healthy mm -hmm. endeavor. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I, I'd like to see you add the figure about the hospitality and restaurant because that's um, a lot of times people uh, minimize that, but it's. People wouldn't be coming if they didn't have a place to stay, didn't have a place to eat. I mean, I, they may be, but they're coming in greater numbers because of that, because of the brew pubs and whatnot. So the, st the study is pretty much already outlined. It's no, I know, but I mean, that, that, one, that one, if you bring in that other place, you've got the two other figures, sure. just to put a uh, percentage okay. in there, that's all I'm saying. Sure. We, we know for the forest and wood, I think it's uh, 1,100 FTE, right, Don? 1,100 full-time jobs are provided by those industries. So you're right, it would be nice to have that figure for hospitality. If we know 359 connected to arts and culture, what's the maybe full-time job equivalent for the hospitality? Or I've worked in hospitality for 10 years and I've seen um, this area grow and I know what we do on our end. And right. uh, I think it's an important. Awesome, part. I agree. Thank you. All right, thank you. Have a great evening. Thank, thank you, you so much. Our, our next uh, presentation is the tobacco retail licensing. Good evening. Good evening. 
I'm Mike McNichol, uh, Clasco County Public Health Director, and to my left is Julia Hess. She's our tobacco uh, prevention coordinator, and uh, she comes to us with, I don't know, how many years? 25 plus years of work. <laughs> 19. Uh, 19, 19 years. Uh, came from Colorado. We recruited her from Colorado to take over the position in tobacco. And so as part of the plan that we have to develop every year for the tobacco program, the state gives us financing to do so. Um, one of the things that she and I talked about was actually because the state has allowed us at the local levels, if we wish, to do tobacco retail licensing. So we came to here before you as a, just kind of outline to you what that would look like um, and what that would mean and then try to get some, get your feelings about whether or not we should pursue it or not. So I'll let Julia go ahead. Okay. Thank you. And you all have your packets? Yep. Okay, so I tried. Thank to, you for those packets. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I've tried to cut my little spiel here down to about 10 minutes. We'll see how I do. So um, tobacco retail licensing is part, of, a lot of different states are doing this. I worked on it in Colorado. Um, Oregon is focusing on the retail environment as a way of reducing youth um, smoking rates and keeping that initiation age as high as we can. Um, and a partner to their licensing is the Tobacco 21 law that was just signed into law um, as of January 1st, which will pre uh, make it illegal to sell tobacco to minors or to, to people under age 21. So the retail environment is really important. It's one of the avenues kids get their tobacco, and we know that 90% of um, people are addicted by the of uh, smokers are addicted by the age of 21. 50% of those by 16. So clearly, if we can cut off that source, you know, one of the sources of it, then we can really bring those rates down. Um, so we're going to be working on this over probably a year. It takes a long time. We want to build a lot of community awareness around it and pull in our partners. I'm working really closely with Jill Quackenbush, our prevention specialist, um, the North Coast Prevention Works Coalition, and their Associated Youth Coalition. So we'll have youth involved in this as um, some leadership training for advocacy work. And, and that to me is really exciting. And then the American Cancer Society, this is on their radar too. They're working on the state level and now they're working on the local level. They're choosing us to work with also. Um, so what a retail license will do is, you know, it's what it says it is. Anybody that sells tobacco will have to apply for a license um, in order to sell it. And what that does, and most people are surprised that's not required already. And I'm talking fast. <laughs> Am I going too fast? That's right. We're listening fast. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, so it takes. It gives them incentive to not sell, to not break the law, because if you take their license away, um, it cuts off a huge profit. Tobacco is probably their largest profit maker. Um, and right now, the only control we have over that, there are fines, but the. The only people that um, do um, the decoy, the youth decoy, what's the word? Yeah. Um, inspections. Inspections are through the SINAR amendment. It's a federal law, so the ATF sends somebody out. Um, I think every few years is what it is in Oregon, and they'll only hit a couple of stores in the county. So, and I haven't looked at those.